All right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Wesley Pate, and this past year I worked on creating a microfluidic device to rapidly test for iron deficiency anemia. Worked with Dr. Mohamed Zaman in the Zaman lab here at BU. So just real quick, I wanted to sort of set the stage for iron deficiency anemia, sort of give you a sense of why it's such a worldwide problem. Iron deficiency is the most common and widespread nutritional disorder in the world. As well as affecting a large number of children and women in developing countries, it is the only nutrient deficiency which is also significantly prevalent in industrialized countries. The numbers are staggering. Two billion people, over 30% of the world's population, are anemic, many due to iron deficiency, and in resource poor areas, this is frequently exacerbated by infectious disease. So just to sort of define what anemia is, it's either a decrease in the number of red blood cells or a decrease in the amount of hemoglobin in your body both which limit your oxygen carrying capacity and can lead to like a variety of problems. Uh, as I said, two billion people in the world are anemic and in resource limited areas, the diagnosis becomes even more of an issue um, due to main, like three main uh, categories. So one is genetic hemoglobin disorders, second being nutrition, and last being infectious disease. So in these areas, these problems all run rampant and so it's really hard to get a specific diagnosis. So currently, they have methods to test for anemic severity, but there's really no test for uh, different root causes. So what I'm focusing on specifically is iron deficiency anemia, which is the most common uh, nutritional disorder and the most common cause of uh, anemia. And so to sort of approach this process, I needed to figure out a platform and a technology that would work in resource limited areas. And what I ran across is microfluidic chips, so what they do is they not only allow your design to be portable and lightweight, but they also allow for small amounts of fluid, as the name suggests, to be passed through. So all these factors combined allow it to be a really cost-effective um, manner to handle the diagnosis. And I've modeled my uh, design after a chip that was created at Columbia called the M-Chip, which um, it diagnoses HIV and syphilis using what's called a sandwich ELISA. And so this sandwich ELISA process oops, sorry, um, is diagrams right here. And there's three main components, a capture antibody, an antigen, which is going to represent a blood protein in your body, and a detection antibody that has some sort of visual tag. And the, visual, and the antigen that we're looking at is transferrin receptor, because in elevated levels, transferrin receptor is indicative of iron deficiency anemia. And so I just want to summarize what we set out to do. First, we want to just create the actual device, design it and fabricate it. Next, we wanted to develop that uh, sandwich ELISA system, optimize it specific to the concentrations we needed, and last, combine those two aims and make a diagnostic device and test it. Uh, so you'll see here at the right uh, is our design. So it consists of one inlet, five outlets, and five wells and subsequent channels. And so what we did is we laser cut with a UV laser into a 1.5 millimeter piece of, of acrylic, which is just a hard plastic, and then sandwiched it in between a glass slide for stability and a polydimethylsiloxane top layer. And that allowed us to punch basically very tiny holes and insert plastic tubing and get a um, sort of good loading, unloading system that's like suction down, um, no leaks. And this also allowed for you to use either a hand syringe, which is common in clinical practice, or an automated pumping system. So this is just a run, a successful run of the, um, the chip. So as you can see, all five uh, channels are filling up at relatively equal speeds. And um, towards the end, you'll see that there's an equal um, dispersion of the air as well. So you get a good, nice clearing of the channels, which is important for the actual ELISA. Um, so um, I'm not going to really go into the, the physics and math here, but I basically just want to highlight this bottom equation, the flow equation. So what we were able to do is use Ohm's law and model it into fluid flow and come up with a flow that's just based on the pressure that you're inputting, as well as the uh, parameters of the actual chip, so width, height, length, as well as the viscosity of the fluid you're passing, which is just similar to that of water. Um, so yeah. And what we did is we compared the experimental values we got to 
uh, I'm sorry, the theoretical values we got from that model to the experimental values. And so this figure to the right shows um, that, so basically we're increasing the pressure and then measuring the volumetric flow. So this shows in here in the red that uh, that's the three PSI, and then as you increase the pressure to nine PSI, you're getting a steady increase in slope, which just means more flow. And um, though we did get linear trends and the flow was constant, uh, it was much less than the theoretical values we got, and there were a few reasons for that. So one is a limitation of the actual model we were using. So because we have these big wells that are much bigger than the channels, you have an issue of turbulence and decreased velocity, which both are going to cause decreased flow. So one is a limitation of the model. The second is a limitation of the binding process. So we used a obstacle adhesive because it's clear when it dries. And we noticed that it spilled over into the actual channels and into the wells and caused occlusions, either partial or full. So this raises the internal resistance of the chip and then in turn decreases your flow. And in addition to the flow testing, we also wanted to test how it would run in the actual ELISA. So the ELISA consists of you know, two main washing steps of important, rea of important reagents. And so we modeled that with blue and yellow uh, food coloring water. And what we found is like, they overall ran pretty well initially, but then over time they started to deteriorate in performance because of the binding process we were using, especially with the automated pumping system. It was putting too much strain on the binding. And so you can see that red circle here. That's showing where the actual PDMS was coming up and like um, coming up away from the acrylic layer. So the, this is the same trial, but um, you, can, you can see it started out initially fine and then uh, just started deteriorating it over time. So a better binding process in the future is what like, would be needed to be explored. And so after we did the actual chip testing, we needed to start optimizing the ELISA. And um, so we, it consisted really of two main uh, visualizations. So one is a fluorescence and one is color metric. And uh, basically what we needed to do is establish a linear trend between the TFR concentration, the antigen we're trying to establish and capture, and the visualization. So it, in this case would be absorbance. You can use an absorbance reader for both of those. Um, and we ran into a lot of problems. So. The two big ones that were holding us up were saturation and differentiation. So the way the ELISA works is that you know, you're only going to have a certain amount of regions to bind as well as what's really important is you want to make sure that what's binding, it's binding specifically to your antigen, specifically to your antibody. And what was happening we think is that it was binding to the wells and we explored a, a bunch of different blocking reagents, um, increased the concentration, increased the actual reagent, it was like it was no good. It was still not getting any differentiation, uh, not getting any saturation. Like we were getting some, but not enough to like apply it into diagnosis. And uh, the fluorescence. So we, after we did the color metric, when we were getting those problems. We, you know, towards the end, started looking at fluorescence, and that was a whole different issue. Of we couldn't even get the um, antibody to bind specifically to anything. We would put it under the plate, and then there, it's like it wasn't even there. It would just get washed away. Um, so that really held us up, but we wanted to sort of at least start the miniaturization process. So one thing we can do is we can estimate the diffusion time in order to relate that back to incubation times. And um, so you have here again, I'm not going to get too much into the math, but uh, you have this uh, last, last equation that represents your diffusion time. And it, you can see it's based on just the volume of the well, the length, the diffusion constant, and the co cross-sectional area. And we used fixed second law as well as estimating the actual diffusivity, uh, diffusion coefficients of our antibodies and antigens. And this allowed us to get a range between like one and five seconds, which is extremely, like, was extremely promising. And you know, my title says rapid test. So that was, that was really promising that even if I was off by like say a factor of 10, I'm still gonna be under a minute, like these tests, which is good. Um, so future directions. Uh, I've, I've talked about most of these, but again, AIM-1, I want to optimize this bond, bonding process, make sure stuff doesn't come up. Uh, it could be an aerated glue, it could be a lower viscosity glue, or this process of hot embossing, which is more of a permanent bond and using the structural capabilities of actual materials to more permanently bond. Uh, and the second one, we just need to optimize the ELISA. We need to, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of how in depth of a process this actually was. Um, it usually takes, you know, a team of 20 guys, 
uh, not 20, but like 10 guys and working on it for like a couple years uh, to optimize this. And you know, so that's just something that needs to continue to be pursued. Um, but again, I think that, that our device that we created really does have long-term uh, potential, whether it be the rapid nature of it, whether it be the cost effectiveness of it. Like, I think the platform is good. We just need to keep working on the um, device itself. And again, one thing I want to mention um, is the cost. So total, the chip's going to run for under $3 because um, we have antibodies that we, like, the antibodies are normally pretty expensive, but what this allows is the small fluid nature of it to really just drive down the price. So you're getting like a dime per antibody uh, that reagents you need. And additionally, like the materials, it's cheap plastic. I can get a huge four by eight foot sheet for like 25 bucks. Comes down to like, again, maybe like 15 cents per chip for the materials. And then the, the main expensive thing is the PDMS, but that is really important because it suctions everything down. Um, but again, even if I'm off by, you know, a certain factor, it's still, our high estimate is, you know, three to five dollars, which is, can be a disposable device at that price, which is nice. Um, and then, yeah, so the last aim, once everything has been established between the chip and the ELISA, you want to take that and put it into a, a diagnostic tool. So we would have to reestablish that linear trend, make sure um, we can get that predictive model again, then uh, test different blood samples, so diseased versus um, normal blood. And so basically how it would work is you would just run the blood through, you'd get a signal, you'd read it, and you'd say, okay, you're above this concentration, so therefore you have um, iron deficiency anemia. So that's generally how that would play in the field. And then, yeah, just long term. Um, so I'm specifically looking at iron, but there's a lot of other uh, nutrient deficiencies that can be related to anemia. So you can... Uh, you can include vitamin A, you can include folic acid, B12, like you could technically make like a whole chip that's maybe, you know, uh, like five by six centimeters and uh, put it all on one thing, run it, and then you can get like a very like complete uh, nutrient uh, deficiency um, reading, like diagnosis. So it's a lot more specific, which is definitely needed. Um, yeah. And that's it, just if we have time for any questions. Yeah. Sure, so again, they're, they run on a, uh, like either a fluorescent tag or one of the color metric, um, sort of, it would be specifically a blue color that you're um, screening for. And you just use like a typical like absorbance reader. So you have a light source um, that you, sh you shine through it and you have a reader at the bottom and it tells you like the differential. So it'll tell you like the, the delta absorbance and those you can relate to uh, like different intensities. No, in a microscope. And you can, you can create it um, pretty cheaply. Like the ones at BU are more expensive because they're more precise, but, and they also do like a lot more functions, but you know, um, like for example, that that M chip, they use like their own reader. They've that where they just has like the light source, like everything that's needed, a light source, the inner uh, power source, and that's pretty much it. And so they can make a reader for under hundred dollars, which is a feasible thing. And uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you.